My hello everybody. So today we are going to get into pelvic girdle rotations uh, in the pelvis is transverse plane and how when you're in anatomical position that's going to coincide with internal and external rotations that are responsible for spinning it. Remember the analogy uh, and if you don't quite know what I'm talking about, go watch the, the previous lecture, right? But remember, the pelvis has a perspective of spin, like a basketball. The basketball could spin in a transverse plane, the sagittal plane, or the frontal plane. But the basketball can't spin itself. Something has to be responsible for spinning that ball, and that's where traditional joint motions come in. Uh, the ball was spun because of right hand motion, left hand motion, or both hands motion. And eventually, I'm going to show you how the basketball could be spun because of if you palm the ball over the top, that's going to be trunk stuff. But for now, we're just looking at right hip, left hip, both hips. In anatomical position, this is important. In anatomical position, anterior and posterior pelvic girdle rotations are going to be because of hip flexions and extensions. Obviously, it depends on which one you're doing. But the point is sagittal and sagittal, they line up. Flexions and extensions are sagittal, and anterior and posterior are sagittal. In anatomical position, it all lines up. They're all seeing the same thing. In the frontal, right and left lateral is going to line up with ab and adduction. Because in anatomical position, they're both seeing the same thing. In the transverse, in anatomical position, from anatomical position, if that helps to clarify that, Right and left transverse is going to be because of internal and external rotations. Okay, My job is to teach you to not fall for the illusions. Okay, Because there's some big time illusions with this. And it all comes back to cap and bottle. Now, I lectured on this, but it's so important, I'm going to repeat it. If the... Joint motion, this is an analogy, but if joint motions of this bottle is open and close, I know I've said this at least three times, but it's so important I'm going to do it a fourth. Open and close, that's the functional motion. And I could either open this bottle, because technically it's the bottle and the cap, a relationship between two separate parts, right? That's the articulation right here. The cap is separate from the bottle, and it forms a unit that can have motion relative to each other's segments. So if I want to have the motion of open, I can spin the cap this way, because the cap is small. It's hard to maybe see how it's moving. So watch my arm that's connected to it. Watch my radial ulna joint. Open by spinning the cap this way. Open 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 okay that's opening rotations but i can also open by spinning the bottle the other way open open okay let's do the opposite for close 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 so it's tight already or i could do close close <laughs> So do you see that opposition, right? If both of them spun the same way, it wouldn't open. I would just be doing this. They have to spin in opposition. And spinning in opposition means spinning two different global directions, but one local direction. Okay? So keep that in mind when I'm about to show you. So let me put up my phone. Let's get to business. All right. Here we go. Let's see if I can make this work. If I get this hand out of the way. All right. So here's the deal. Transverse plane. I can have 
transverse plane. I'm going to show you with the skeleton, and then I'm going to do it with my body, okay? Right hip, external rotation. Right hip, external rotation. Now, my foot is off of the ground. Because I wouldn't be able to spin my foot if it wasn't off the ground. Right hip, external. Right hip, internal. A right leg, spin laterally. Right hip, lateral rotation. Left foot, medial rotation. External, internal. Now, that's how we call it because this is the less massive segment moving about the more massive segment. The pelvis has more stuff about it. So again, I give the analogy of when you're uh, turning a water faucet knob, you look at it from the perspective of the knob because that's the smaller end. You're not going to look at it from the perspective of the house. The house usually doesn't move. The door moves about the wall. The wall does not move about the door. But in biomechanics, in our human body, we don't always move the smaller part about the bigger part. Sometimes we move the bigger part about the smaller part. And that's what I need you guys to see. From here to there, I have the same joint motion. I have the same change in relative angle. If I move the ball about the socket globally this way, or the socket about the ball globally that way, I have the same change. Right hip external, right hip, external, right hip, internal, right hip, internal. Take you to the same place, okay? Now, from the pelvic girdle perspective, hey pelvis, now the pelvis is one thing, hey pelvis, spin to your right. The pelvis is going to do this. Hey pelvis, spin to your left is going to do that. The pelvis doesn't have, the pelvis is one thing. Because remember, my right and my left are connected. Hey, pelvis, look to your right. Okay. Hey, pelvis, look to your left. All right. So the trick is to show you how the hip moves relative to the pelvis and to show you that that in itself is very tricky because of global referencing. as an analogy, so there's the pelvis, okay, look right, look left, anterior, posterior, right lateral, left lateral, right, he's, he's dead tired, we're going to give him a break, okay, he's dead tired, anterior, bilateral hip flexion, posterior because of bilateral hip extension, right lateral because of left hip adduction and right hip abduction, left lateral because of left hip abduction and right hip adduction. Now let's get to the transverse. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Left transverse Remember, right and left means two different things in two different dimensions. Right and left means nothing sagittal. You do a front roll, you do a back roll. There's nothing right or left about it. But if you're going to do a cartwheel to your right or a cartwheel to your left, that's frontal plane description of right and left. Right lateral, left lateral. That communicates that, oh, I'm in the frontal plane. Look to your right, look to your left is a transverse concept. Right transverse, spin to your right, spin to your left. Now, here is where the confusion comes. I taught you that when my foot is off the ground, right external looks like this. So your instinct is anything on my right side that spins the same way that my hip did when it's off the ground must be external. That's Pavlov stuff. We are great at pattern recognition. But that actually goes against us when there's illusions. When there's illusions, our pattern recognition can actually be a deterrent. So what I'm trying to get you guys to see is, yes, 
when my leg is free to move, external, internal. But when my leg is fixed, like when my feet are on the ground, and the socket moves about the ball, the instinct is to say right hip external, but that's not true. I have right hip internal rotation. I'm going to show you a better way to prove this or to see it. I'm going to tilt my body a little bit to do the same motion so that we can look at it from the perspective of my pelvis. Remember, the pelvis is always right. The pelvis is never lost. We can always look at planes and axes from the pelvis's perspective. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. How is my hip in rotating relative to the pelvis? Wouldn't I have to externally rotate it to go back home? Yes, Brad, you sure would have to externally rotate it to go back home. Thank you, Mr. Pumpkin. That meant I had to internally rotate it when I left home. Here I am in anatomical position relative to my hips and pelvis. And I have right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. My right hip is internally rotated. So the only way, remember, point, description of motion. How do you have to move to get there? If I start here and then I end there, how did I have to move to get there? I start and finish, right? Start anatomical position. I'm here. I'm just showing you where I'm at. And then I do this. I went from home to being internally rotated. The only way that's possible is to have internal rotation. My right hip is internally rotated, but your instinct is going to want to say external rotation because of the global trap that is being set. Look at the in position. One way to really prove this is all right, don't move my hip. Keep my hip in the same position and bring everything else back to anatomical. I'm going to bring my left leg back to anatomical. Everything else is back home. But look at my hip. I am not externally rotated. I am internally rotated. That's very true, Brian. I, I've, I've taken uh, kinesiology classes uh, every Halloween, and uh, I know a lot about bones and a lot about motion, and you are 100% USDA Torch Certified internally rotated. How would I have to rotate to go back to anatomical? I'd have to externally rotate my hip. Therefore, I had to be internally rotated. I had to have internal rotation. This is extremely important because a lot of motions we do in sport, activities of daily living, require pelvic girdle rotations and subsequent hip motion. So it's really important for you guys to understand that when I do this, my instinct is wanted to say external, but the reality is I am internally rotated. And the exact opposite from my other hip. Why do I say the exact opposite? It works itself out that it's going to be the exact opposite. Because if I have a ball that I'm trying to spin with both of my hands, it makes sense that this hand wants to go forward and this hand wants to go back. It's called a force couple in physics. So it makes sense that my hips are going to want to do opposite things. We have precedent for this. My hips do opposite things in the frontal plane, right? In other words, in the frontal plane, I can't have both hips abduct. I can't do it. To make the pelvis rotate to the side, one has to adduct and the other has to abduct. They have to work in opposition. The same thing for the transverse plane. If both feet are on the ground, in order to make the pelvis look to the right, right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, my right hip has to internally rotate, and my left hip has to externally rotate.
right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. My right hip is internally rotated. Sorry, I'm jumping. My right hip is internally rotated, as you can see. But what about my left hip? Well, why don't you bring everything back to anatomical position, Brian? Maybe we can kind of figure this out. Mr. Pumpkin, are, are, there's no tricks here, right? No, 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 no tricks. Uh, trust me, just bring it back to anatomical position, and, and uh, let's see if we can see the new position of the left hip. All right, I trust you, Mr. Pumpkin. Everything back to anatomical. Guys, look at my left hip. It's externally rotated. It started out at anatomical, and then I did this, and then I brought everything back just to show you the new position of my left hip. It went from here to there. It all makes sense. If I have right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, it's because my right and my left hip work in opposition in the transverse plane. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation because of right hip internal rotation and because of left hip external rotation. Left transverse pelvic girdle rotation because of right hip internal rotation and because of left hip external rotation. Get it? Now, I don't have to have both feet on the ground. If I have both feet, that makes for a, a good fourth couple, but I could totally have right and left transverse pelvic girdle rotation just because of one foot on the ground. So if I start here and I have left transverse, that was because of right hip external. And if I have right transverse, that was because of right hip internal. Not very good at balance. I'm a very good at balance. Left transverse because of right hip external. Right transverse because of right hip internal. See it on the left leg. Right transverse because of left hip external. Left transverse because of left hip internal. And this leg just kind of serves as a kickstand, right? When I'm about to fall over, it just kind of pulls. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, left transverse pelvic girdle rotation. So if I was a right-handed batter and I was going to swing and I did this, My left leg is the lead leg, and I'm going to rotate about it so that I can torque my pelvis and my body as I swing. What type of hip motion on my left leg, specifically my left hip, of course, if I'm saying left hip motion, would correspond with the left transverse pelvic girdle rotation? So what was the pelvic girdle rotation? I just told you, left transverse. What was the hip motion that caused it? Left hip internal rotation. I'm going to freeze it and bring it back to, to anatomical. Freeze her and Abram in the green. I'm internally rotated when I go from here to there. Look at it from this angle. From here to there. Hey, everybody! Yeah, they know each other. Hip internally rotated. That was a pirate fire. Ah! Start, finish. Left hip internal rotation to get there. And that's what the inverted is. Okay? All right. So, let me see my time. Let's review. Pelvic girdle rotations. And then what's responsible? feet are on the ground. When my feet are off the ground, it's going to be because of trunk motion. I'm going to get to that Wednesday and Friday, the next lecture. Okay? Here we go. Review. Pause if you need. I'm going to take away this. You did a great job. Thank you, Mom. All right. Let's practice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some practice questions, and you can pause the video and then try to figure them out. That's the best way to practice.
and I'm going to give it to you in two different views. I'm going to let you see my pelvis and my feet. Okay? And then I'm going to scroll up and just let you see my pelvis and my trunk. Because at the end of the day, if my feet are on the ground, you need to be able to visualize, well, if my pelvis does this and his feet stayed on the ground, then the hips must have done that. So you'll still be able to see the legs, but you won't be able to see my feet. Okay, it's a fact. Got to get off the tricycle and start bicycling. And then when we get to, the, to, to hanging off from a bar, then we're going to be unicycling. First one. I'm putting my hands on my pelvis to give you reference. Okay. Start, finish. Start, finish. I'm going to give you question is, did I have pelvic girdle rotation? If the answer is yes, then how did the pelvis rotate? Then the follow-up question is, what was responsible for the pelvic girdle rotation? What joint motion moved to make the pelvis bend? Okay? So, first thing I'm going to do, first of all, pause it if you need to think about it. Welcome back. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the plane of spin. Okay, now of course your view of this is sagittal, but the pelvis's perspective is always going to be sagittal in terms of where it's facing. So this is sagittal plane spin of my pelvis. How did it spin in the, in its sagittal plane? It spun forward, anterior roll, anterior spin. If you're looking at it in terms of pouring liquid. If Mr. Pumpkin was filled with pumpkin juice or butterbeer, for my Harry Potter fans out there, it would pour water out the front. Anterior pelvic girdle rotation, anterior pumpkin girdle rotation. And then coming back would obviously posterior. Anterior, posterior. Anterior, posterior. What joint motion of my hip caused the anterior pelvic girdle rotation? Well, in this case, I had left hip flexion that caused the anterior and left hip extension that caused the posterior. The illusion being my hip doesn't look like it's moving, it is. My right hip looks like it's moving and it's not. It's staying in an anatomical position. Okay. What about if I did both legs on the ground? Anterior because of bilateral hip flexion, posterior because of bilateral hip extension. Okay, how about this one? No, no clues here. Well, the clues in the clothing, right? You gotta visualize Mr. Pumpkin. Yes, visualize me, visualize me. All right, you're done. Pumpkin's here. Pelvic girdle rotation and hip motion, because the hip motion is what made the pelvis spin. Start, finish. Obviously, we could talk about coming back, but one part at a time. We, we don't eat the apple in one bite. Little bites of the apple. Start, finish. When I shake like that, that's me shaking the Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> so we spot all over. Start, finish. 
pelvis rotate? Yep. What plane? It's frontal. How did it spin in its frontal? Right lateral. Bucket, pour water out the right side. Right lateral spin. Right lateral pelvic girdle rotation. What hip or hip motion was responsible for that spin? There's the pelvis, always correct, always, never lost. Pelvis's perspective is never lost. Left hip adduction, right hip abduction. What about if I started here and came back here? Well, that's left lateral spin. Start, my left hip is adducted. And it goes from being adducted to anatomical position. The only way that can happen is if I have left hip abduction. My right hip started out abducted and it came back to anatomical. The only way I could do that is to have adduction. Watch, here's another way to look at it. at it the other way. Start. Okay. See what I'm saying? Watch. Try one more time. I'll do both of them. Start. Finish. Left hip ab, right hip ab. Cool stuff, huh? Really cool stuff. Now, let's look at the same examples. I have the same example. I gave you one on sagittal. I'm going to give you frontal plane with one leg. Let's see how you do. Pelvic girdle rotation, hip motion responsible for it. Now, of note, if I do this, my left leg is off the ground. Meaning that I can have left hip motion, but notice how I can have all the left hip motion I want. My pelvis isn't going to keep spinning until my right hip spins it. So in other words, my left hip motion is insignificant. It doesn't matter what my left hip is doing. The only way my pelvis is going to rotate sagittally, frontal, or transversely with my right leg on the ground is if my right hip does it. but you can see the illusion, right? Notice how my left hip stayed in its anatomical position, but notice how my right hip became abducted. So I had right lateral pelvic girdle rotation because of right hip abduction. The right hip abduction made the whole pelvis rotate to its right laterally in its frontal plane. Let's do another one. Let's say I balance on my left leg and I do this. I'm trying to keep my pelvis uh, balanced. Boom. I bring my right hip down. Start. Finish. Start. That's not the sound effects. That's actually the sound that my hips make when I do these moves because they're at my hip today. Start. Doom. Finish. How was the spin? Right lateral. Pouring water out. Guys, if this book represented the top of a bucket of water, I can pour water out the right side by either lifting up the left side, water's pouring out, or dropping the right side. And it doesn't matter. Because you know what? It's the same spin. This and this is the same rotational spin. So it's the same concept. I have right lateral by hiking the left side up or dropping the right side down. Doom. Right lateral. Because of doom, left hip adduction. The pelvic girdle rotation was because of my left hip adducting. Okay. Now, the transverse stuff. 
start, finish. Start, finish. I'm going to show you this is the exact same motion, just in a different plane. Uh, a different view. I want to say plane, same plane. Start, finish. Start, finish. illusionary examples here. The first illusion is a lot of people might want to save the right hip externally rotated because globally you see something on the right side doing this. But my right hip stayed in its exact same position frontally, sagittally, or transversally. My right hip didn't do anything. Another way you can look at this is if I had a cast on my right leg and I couldn't move my right leg if I wanted to. I could still pivot around my left and make it look like this. So where was the motion? Not on the right side, but on the left side. I had left hip external rotation. I am externally rotated. I started out in anatomical, and I ended here. I had to have external rotation. Another way to look at this is, hey, left hip, you left home. Yeah, man, I'm externally rotated. How can I prove it? Well, wouldn't I have to internally rotate to go meet you guys back home? Another way to look at it is here. If I do this, the left hip would have to internally rotate to come meet everybody back home. Therefore, you had to externally rotate. Internal rotation, external rotation. Left hip internal, left hip external. Right hip, nothing. Went along for the ride. The right hip looked like it was rotating, but it wasn't. The left hip looks like it's not rotating, and it is. Illusion. What was the pelvic girdle rotation? This is right transverse. I know you can't get enough on the rock. Shut up. Right transverse. Left transverse. Right transverse. Left transverse. Well, what happens if you just rotate the hips? Bilateral external. Bilateral internal. Pelvis didn't do anything. Pelvis didn't spin. Sagittally, frontally, or transversely. So I can have... Let's have a TED Talk. I can have hip motion with no pelvic girdle rotation. As, and I'm going to show you when we get into the trunk, I can have pelvic girdle rotation without hip motion. But I can't have pelvic girdle rotation without one or the other. If I am going to be responsible for rotating my pelvis about my body, it's got to be because of the right hip, left hip, both hips, or trunk. And the, the, the real long-term play is to show you how all of those segments are going to work together for our function. Where, I give an example, where your hips may be responsible for extension for posterior pelvic girdle rotation, but you don't want your upper body to fly back with it. So how are you going to cancel out your pelvis wanting to bring your upper body back by flexing the trunk to keep your shoulders level, to keep your eyes level? If your pelvis, if your pelvis rotates right lateral and you don't want your trunk to go along your upper extremity and your eyes to go along for the ride, you're going to bend your trunk back the other way to keep your shoulders level, to keep your eyes level so that you can keep working. That's what happens when people get tired and they shift their weight on one leg. Their pelvis does this, left lateral. Well, if you kept your trunk straight, you'd be leaning to the left globally. So how do you compensate that to keep your shoulders and your eyes level? You bend the trunk back to your right. Look, you can even see the bend in my shirt. Shift back the other way. Shift back the other way. Pelvis does this, trunk bends back. Pelvis does that, trunk bends back. Sounds like a...
so that's what's coming. What's coming is to show you guys how hips, pelvis, and trunk kind of work together um, for function. But we got to see, we got to look at the illusions of pelvic girdle spins or pelvic girdle positions and the joints that are responsible for those spins or those positions, okay? We're not done yet. I promised you guys we're going to do some practice examples where uh, you can't see my feet, okay? So this is really great. This is where your visualization of what's happening at the hip is of importance. Because remember, the feet can lie to you. The feet can trick you. Uh, an example of that is uh, vodka. I'm just kidding. An example of that is this. Most people might say that was internal rotation, but the reality is, is that it was external rotation. Internal, external. And the illusion occurs because my knees are flexed. Elbows flex and the hand goes anterior. So the hand follows internal and external rotation. When the knees flex, the foot goes posterior. So it actually follows the opposite, external, internal. So a lot of times when people do this, they'll get this wrong because they just see foot and they say, oh, the foot came in. Well, we got to remember where the motion's happening. The motion's happening here, external, internal, okay? So the point is, is that having the feet to see can be a blessing or a curse. So I got to be able to get you to see motion from where it's happening. Okay, so let's do some examples where you can't see the footsies, all right? No little piggies in these examples, excuse me. responsible left hip adduction right hip abduction coming back left lateral coming back left hip abduction right hip adduction Posterior pelvic girdle rotation because of bilateral hip extension. Right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Now, I may need to give you a little information here. Both feet are on the ground, so you can mimic this exper experiment where you're at. Because that would be something if I did this, and then, well, that proves in opposing, right? You could figure that out. Both feet are on the ground. Right transverse, because of right hip internal, and because of left hip external. Left transverse, because of left hip internal, and because of right hip external. Got it? Let's see what it would look like if I just did one leg, where you couldn't see my feet. see the outside of my leg here, but now you see it. You know what that tells me? It went along for the ride. Okay? I wouldn't ask it again. But you could look for clues uh, in the clothing uh, that would lend that to you. All right? So, <clears throat> in summary, Mr. Pumpkin is crazy. He doesn't get out much. He only gets out once a year. One, one season a year. This is, can be tricky. However, I promise you, once you get it, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. 
which is to me is super powerful about this kind of information where it's not like you'd have to pressure cook, you know, memorizing, you know, the five laws of this and the 10 laws of that. And then, and then you, know, you take your test and then you, I remember in undergrad, I had a, I think it was like a, a health promotion kind of class and the professor, I think his name was Dr. Manier. For no other reason, he's just like, you need to memorize these 15 words, random words in kinesiology. Blah. Yeah, just got to practice memorizing stuff. I mean, I, this was in 99, 98, 99. Balance, tactile, laterality, auditory, aerobic, overloading, flexibility, KR, self-esteem, gender, kinesthetic, visual, anaerobic, atrophy, and grouping. Having to do that took up space in my brain that I'm never going to be able to refill. So I hate memorization. Obviously, we have to memorize. Oh, and he only asked one question about that, by the way. I learned it to a Kenny Chesney song. Balance, tactile, laterality, auditory, aerobic, overloading. Sorry. But my point is, is that that took up brain space that I could have used for like cool stuff like wrestling and, and football knowledge. I don't want you guys to have to memorize stuff. Yeah, we're going to have to learn some terms. But I'm more interested in teaching you kinesiology like math, where it's conceptual. You can figure things out. Because, ladies and gentlemen, even though everybody kind of has the same ingredients, not everybody has the same recipe. I'll say that again. You have a gourmet chef who has the same ingredients that I do to cook something. Who's this going to taste better? Right? The chef, he just knows the nuances. I'm a hack. I'm just oh, That looks good. That's... So my point is, is that everybody has the same ingredients, but not everybody has the same recipe. Some people are taller. Some people are shorter. Some people have more range of motion, less range of motion, more range of motion in their lower extremity, less range of motion in their upper extremity, vice versa. As a kid, I was fascinated with pitching, with baseball in general. I'd watch baseball all the time on TV. And one of the things that intrigued me about it is pitchers, pro, the, the professionals, the people I'd watch, they were all doing the same thing, but every one of them looked different doing it. And I would imitate them. I'd be like, this is my Dwight Gooden pitch. And I'd, my old, I had an older brother and older sister, and I used to annoy the heck out of them. Still do, I guess. And I'd be like, hey, guys, watch my Sid Fernandez pitch and watch my Dwight Gooden pitch. Hey, watch my Nolan Ryan, you know, big leg kick. And you could Im imitate them because you understood that they all did the same thing differently. So that's why this is so important to not memorize these stuff, but to teach you the nuances of joint motion and position so that you could apply it infinitely many ways. For you coaches. When you're going to be looking and helping athletes, they're all going to have the same ingredients, but they're all going to have different recipes. And only a seasoned chef is going to be able to really help those kids because you know your way around a kitchen. Okay? All you therapists, same thing. You know, understanding the chain and understanding that limitations in ankle motion can affect pelvic injuries and back injuries and shoulder injuries. You gotta be able to understand kind of how all these things fit. I'm not here to explain how all that works. That's graduate school. But I am here to teach you the foundations of how to apply all of that really cool stuff that you guys are gonna do. You chiropractors, you therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, recreational therapists, all of you prosthetics and orthotic specialists, you athletic trainers, you physical educators, personal trainers, CrossFit enthusiasts, and coaches. I have to get you to see inside that body and literally visualize how these hips are moving relative to the pelvis and the hips and what's coming, the trunk. And I can't promise you the world, but I can promise you that if you take the time to understand these concepts, You'll never forget them. And it's only going to grow. Your, your, your working concepts of this stuff is only going to build on your understanding 
of a huge world of human movement capabilities for function, for sport, for activities of daily living, for self-defense, for protection. So if you, you reap what you sow, we, we plant those seeds of understanding now. And it's just going to sprout this vast oak tree of knowledge that's going to last you for the rest of your life. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Watch it as many times as you want, of course. Hit me up if you have any questions, and uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Bye-bye.